Turn to your second choice and just say, eh. Well, good morning, Liberty Church. And good morning to those of you that have tuned in online. You know, just during the worship, I was just thinking about a scripture in Genesis where one of the chief characters has this amazing experience with God. And, and he just pauses and he says, how awesome is this place? None other than the house of the Lord. And I was just in awe of what God is doing here in this church. It's a part of what you are, it's a part of what you've helped build and what God's doing all throughout this region because the presence of God is moving and because of great people like you. And I just love to see what God is doing at Liberty Church. Can I get an amen? You know, there's a, a, a quote that says, a, a real friend is one who walks in when the rest of the world walks out. And uh, that is a great definition of my friend and your pastor, Pastor Josh Lipscomb. He's not a good friend, he's a great friend. And he's been a friend in the good times and he's been a friend in the bad times. And what's really scary about it is his wife is one of my wife's closest friends. You know, that doesn't always happen. And it's really scary when they get together. So we try not to let them together too often, but I just am so grateful for my friendship. And I just wanna encourage you that if you call this place home, Man, you have got some amazing leaders. In fact, if you're here and you're searching for a new church, the search is over, you found the right place. But can we just all around this building, can we just give honor to where honor is due and celebrate your pastors, Pastor Josh and Kristen, come on. Great character, great integrity. I'm telling you, they are just some of the best people on the planet and I'm just so grateful to have them in my life. As, as Pastor Josh said, my wife and I, we. We are from the uh, communist state of California, and uh, I got off the plane uh, when I landed here, and I was like, <sighs> I was like, what is this smell? And then it dawned on me as I got off the jetway, this is what freedom smells like. Can I get an amen? <laughs> the land of the free and the home of the brave. I was like, oh, God. I called my wife. You don't even know what it's like here. It's amazing, babe. But no. We, uh, we planted a church 11 years ago in Orange County, California, and uh, you know what? I love my state. Y'all pray for us. You pray for our state. We live in a city, uh, in, in a, a region where 3.2 million people live in about a 20 to 25 mile radius, and only 10% are churched. So it's a mission field. So pray for us. We need a little of the Spirit of God from Florida to come that direction. Can I get an amen? And so... Uh, we're, we're grateful to be here. I've got two daughters, and uh, I think I've talked about this the last time I was with you. I've got a 19-year-old who's in college, so I'm broke as a joke. Can I get an amen from somebody? No, yeah. Oh, man. Junior college sounds really good right now. I got a 14-year-old girl, both girls. I got just women all in my house. My wife, my two kids, all of our dogs are female. Just estrogen wafts through my house. It's pretty rough, but... Uh, I'm honored to be with you. I want to read a scripture. I want to dive in. I want to just encourage you. I want to challenge you. I want us to have a good time today. But here's my hope and my prayer is that we'll leave here changed. That we'll leave here just a little different than we came in. I want to read a passage of scripture that comes out of Ephesians chapter 2. And it's a beautiful passage. Paul's writing to the church at Ephesus. And I just love the message paraphrase of this. And I love the way that's worded. So listen to the scripture. It says this in verse 14. The Messiah has made things up between us so that we're now together on this, both non-Jewish outsider and Jewish insider. He tore down the wall we use to keep each other at a distance. He repealed the law code that had become so clogged with fine print and footnotes that it hindered more than it helped. And then he started over. Instead of continuing with two groups of people separated by centuries of animosity and suspicion, he created a new kind of human being, a fresh start for everyone. Look at verse 19. That's plain enough, isn't it? Isn't it? You are no longer wandering exiles. The kingdom of faith is now your home country. You belong here. Let me say that again. You belong here here with as much right to the name of Christian as anyone. God is building a home. He's using us all irrespective of how we got here and what he is building. He used the apostles and the prophets for the foundation and now he is using you. Turn to your neighbor and say he's using you. 
Now he's using you, fitting you in brick by brick, stone by stone, with Christ Jesus as the cornerstone that holds all the parts together. We see it taking shape day after day, a holy temple built by God, all of us built into it, a temple in which God is quite at home. I want to preach to you today from the title, Built to Build. Turn to your neighbor and say, you are built to build. Can we pray? Hey, before we do, everybody just bows their head immediately when I say, before you, just wait before you bow your head. Everybody take a deep breath. We're here, and the creator of the heavens and earth is here. And he aligned your life and my life uniquely, articulately, and perfectly to get us in this building, in this moment. Let's not waste a moment. Let's lean into the, the power of the Holy Spirit that's already at work. Let, let's open our hearts and our lives and say, God, you do and you speak and you say whatever you want to say. I'm here and I'm ready to listen. And for the next 28 minutes and 36 seconds, probably not, but we'll just pray about it. We'll let the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords do something beautiful in this place. Can we pray now? God, we thank you that you're here. We give you honor and glory. We worship you. You truly only are the only one worthy of our praise. So God, today, from the front to the back and the side to side, from the youngest to the oldest, we open our hearts to you. We open our minds to you and we give you permission to rearrange the proverbial furniture of our life. We did not come here to go home the same. We came here to go home changed. With our open hearts and open minds to the fullness of what you wanna do. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, amen and amen. Well, I want to talk to you about a couple thoughts here, but something that's important for you to know, and, and maybe some of you can relate to this, but it just kind of occurred to me the other day. And, and listen, if you get what I'm saying, then throw your hand up and say, I'm with you, Pastor Kerry. But some of you may not relate. Some of you are in denial. But there is this, this reckoning, this dawn, dawn that opened up my eyes. And I realized in that moment that I'm just getting old. Is there anybody in here who can associate? Okay, I knew I was with the right crowd. They told me first service was the best service. And there's a few indicators to me. That, that helped me see that I was getting old. One of those is that my forehead is now a six head, and I see some of you can relate to that out here. Pastor Matt, we're not saying anything. My hair just slowly, it just slowly started drifting off of my head, but you know, I found it, now it's on my back, and it's just an amazing, nobody else knows what I'm talking about. Okay, it's just, I, I realized that I'm just getting old. And, and another thing I know that I'm getting old is one of my favorite places to be is to be at home. Does anybody else love to be? Yes, yeah. That concludes our service for today. We're so glad you came. I just love to be at home. I love to watch football in my couch. Can I get an amen? The couch cushions are perfectly aligned to, we'll move on. We're gonna move on. Another thing that I, I just realized, I, I love, I, I, I know I'm getting old because one of my favorite places to go is an American grocery store chain called Sam's Club. Does anybody else love? You can get a side of beef, a surfboard, and a power generator all at the same. I'll walk every aisle, but the best part of Sam's Club is what? Samples, I knew it. That's it for real, we're done, we're done. This service, the samples. And when they don't have samples, it's like you wanna punch someone in the face. Why am I even here? Another indicator I'm getting old is we, my wife and I, we try to go away for a night or two if we can every couple of months or so. We went to one of our favorite hotels in Los Angeles, and it's a high-rise hotel, so our room was on the 14th floor, and we walked into the hotel room, and we, we walked in, and the moment we got there, we got to the window, and we realized, oh my gosh, something beautiful is happening outside. There was this construction project taking place, and there was this construction crew who was building a crane, like the, the tall cranes that are kind of in the form of a T. They were building a crane, and the reason they were building the crane was to build another crane to build a building. It was a crane building a crane to build a building. Mind blown. Y'all don't get it. Okay, so we were in this hotel room, and there was a crane being built to build another crane to build a building. Okay, center section. Let's... 
Let me just, can, are y'all with me? Do you realize how crazy? This was a tool. There was a construction crew building a tool, an instrument for building things, to build another tool, an instrument for building things, to build a building. It was a crane building a crane to build a, oh, there we go. Let me just check this back section, all those that got here late, but let me just talk to you for a moment. It was a crane, say it with me, building a crane to build a and it dawned on me after 45 minutes of watching this and sipping some coffee and just giggling at my wife, I am old, but it reminded me that this is a lot like what God is doing with the church. You see, it was a construction crew that was building a tool, an instrument for building something. But the tool that they were building was going to build another tool, an instrument for building something, so they could actually build a building. A crane building a crane to build a building. And it's a lot like what God is doing in his church. You see, God is building you and me so that we can build his church, so that we can reach some more people. Can I get an amen? Like a crane building a crane to build a... You're never going to forget this message, I'm going to tell you right now. And Jesus is building his church. And one of my mentors, Pastor Kevin Gerald, he says that the church is God's idea, it's not man's idea. It's God's plan A and there ain't no plan B. In fact, there's nothing you or I can do in more cooperation with Jesus than building a life committed to building his church. There's nothing that you or I can do that's more in line with what Jesus' heart is for humanity than to live a life committed to building his church. And we read this in the scriptures. In Ephesians chapter 2, it says this, the Messiah has made things up between us so that we're now together on this, both non-Jewish insider, outsider and Jewish insider. He tore down the wall that we use to keep each other at a distance. Now, I know many of you probably know this. Some of you may not, but in biblical times in the temple, there were different sections and categories within the holy place that were, broke up what people could go into each section. There was the holy of holies, the holy place, the inner court, and the outer court. And on the other side of the outer court was a massive wall that was built down the center of it. And if you were not a Jew, then you were not allowed to come on this side of that massive wall. In fact, there was a sign written in both Latin and in Greek that said, if you are not a Jew and you cross to this side of the wall, we're going to kill you. I mean, that's not how it said, but that's kind of what it meant. They kept outsiders out and insiders in. They were doing everything they could do to keep them safe. That we're going to make sure our faith is safe. If you're not aligned with our faith, you stay out there. We're going to be in here. And I'm just a little concerned that if we're not careful in the Christian church today, we'll do the same thing. We'll build a church that is specifically designed just for Christians. I mean, we, we love the fact that, that Chick-fil-A is closed on Sunday because it's raising a banner for the church of Jesus Christ. We love Christian things. We love to listen to Christian music, and we love all the things Christian, and if we're not careful, we'll build a wall, and people won't even know about the hope found in Jesus because they can't even get into a place like this. Now, I'm not talking about Liberty Church. I'm talking about other churches. Are y'all with me this morning? And I just want to be careful that we don't become guilty of being known, that, that as a church we're known for what we stand against rather than what we stand for. Like, listen, we need to speak truth right now, especially in this current cultural moment. The world has gone crazy. And if you don't, listen, everything you read about California is absolutely true. It's 100% accurate. It's crazy. It's a different world. It's a different planet. And it's nuts. And we need truth like never before, but we cannot remove the, the tenets of our faith like grace and hope and love. Are you with me today? We can't forget to stand for what Jesus stood for. You could find him always in places with reprobates and sinners, with people who had been removed from the, the cultural norms of religion in that day. Jesus would be found with those who were outcasts in that society that couldn't come on the other side of the wall because Jesus stood for grace and hope and love. And he fulfilled the law, and then he removed what we added to it. He reminded us that we are born a sinner, but I'll still die for you. Do you realize that Jesus died for humanity as a step of faith? Do you realize that when he went to the cross and paid the penalty of every sin of every human, he did so knowing that there are some people who would choose to still reject him? 
And he said, even in the midst of the nastiest part of your life, I choose you. Which means no matter your past, no matter your story, no matter your belief, you are loved. Paul goes on and he says, that's plain enough, isn't it? You're no longer wandering exiles. This kingdom of faith is now your home country. You see, Jesus would draw lines in the sand and say, this is the truth, but he would reach over to say, hey, come on in. Let me welcome you into the family. Are you tracking with me? And Paul's saying no one is wandering exiles. There's a place and a home for you. And he calls it the kingdom of faith. And you know what the kingdom of faith is? It's the church. And the church is not a building. The church is not a platform. The church is not a beautiful LED wall. It's not seats. It's not a kid's classroom. It's not the coffee that we drink. Do you know what the church is? Do you know what the kingdom of faith is? It's you. You is the church. Turn to your neighbor and say, you is the church. You know what's awesome about that? You are awesome. You know what's terrifying about that? You're jacked up too. Can I get an amen? How many of you in this room just a little bit jacked up? Raise your hand. Okay, if your hand's not up, we are scared of you. Hide your kids and hide your wife right now. You don't even know what's going to happen. We're in church. There's some, listen, the kingdom of faith is people. And God chose you, jacked up, imperfect, messy people. And yet stuff happens at the church that doesn't happen anywhere else. In fact, I believe the church is the closest thing to heaven on earth. And God uses messy, imperfect, jacked up people. Why? Because things happen here that don't happen anywhere else. Today, right now, across the hallway, your kids are in a classroom having a blast with a bounce house, and they've got teachers who care about them and are getting down to their level, not to babysit your kid, but to speak truth and destiny and hope into your children. That's where the hand clap. <laughs> Stuff happens here that doesn't happen anywhere else. Here, marriages are healed. Here, children discover destiny. Here, broken hearts are mended. The blind see. Hope is restored, and the dead live again. Listen, there's stuff that happens at the church that doesn't happen anywhere else. Are we so comfortable to, with Christianity that we've forgotten that? Are we so comfortable with Christianity that we forgot what Jesus saved us from? I don't know about you, but without Jesus, I am a wretch. I'm a disaster. If I told you the stories of, of my past, you'd say, why is he even preaching? but for the grace of God. And I'd be so terrified if we become so comfortable with Christianity that we forget that right now a miracle is taking place. It's called the church. And stuff happens here that doesn't happen anywhere else. You said, Pastor, I've never seen the dead raised from the dead. Well, have you ever had a dream that died restored? Have you ever had a marriage that you thought was over and for some reason you're still here today and you made it? Have you ever had a kid who wandered away from the faith and, and, and like a prodigal son, he returned? Maybe you have seen the dead live again. The church, the kingdom of faith, not just for Christians, but for a lost and a dying world. And stuff happens here that doesn't happen anywhere else. And God uses imperfect people to do just that. And you know what's terrifying about that? You know what imperfect people do? Imperfect things. Look at me in the eyes, which means that sometimes imperfect things happen at church. Can I get an amen? But it doesn't change the fact that God does things here that he doesn't do anywhere else. And he chose to use people like you and people like me, messy, jacked up, imperfect, to build his church which reaches people just like a crane, building a crane to build a building. The scripture goes on and it says this, you're no longer strangers or outsiders, you belong here with as much right to the name Christian as anyone. God's building a home. He's using us all, irrespective of how you got here and what he's building. He used the apostles and the prophets for the foundation, and now he's using you, fitting you in brick by brick and stone by stone. If we are the kingdom of faith and God chose us and he's building us to build his church, which builds people, then that means that you and I are under construction. 
look at me in the eyes for a moment. You and I are under construction, which means none of us have arrived yet. None of us have hit the pinnacle of faith. We've made it. And like Enoch, we're going to be taken up with God. We're under construction. Why? Because you're messy, imperfect, and jacked up. Can I get an amen? So if we ever get to the place where we feel like we've arrived and we've accomplished it, then we've got some major problems. We've got some issues. And if you don't think you have an issue, that is your issue. So my question for you today in this beautiful first service is what kind of construction project are you? What type of project are you? Where are you in your journey of faith right now? I want to talk about three different types of construction in just a few moments. What construction project are you? I'm not talking to your neighbor, not to your friend, not to your spouse, but to you. And let's let the Holy Spirit kind of identify where we're at. There's three different types of construction I want to talk about. The first is new construction. And this is like being brand new to faith. This is when we come in and we clear the land and we get rid of the trees and we level out the ground and we pour a foundation. And then we say, okay, here's where the framework is going to go up. The beams are going to go up from here. We're starting from scratch. It's brand new. It's a fresh start. We're new to faith. And what we do as the church is we want to come alongside you and help you build some new walls. And you're going to say, I'm going to say no to the things that I used to say yes to. And I'm going to say yes to the things. I'm going to open a door here to the power of the Holy Spirit at work in my life. I'm going to put a window here. And I'm not going to hang out with the people I used to hang out with. Now I'm going to engage in relationships with the body of Christ, that's what new construction is. And if you're here and maybe you've only been in a relationship with Jesus for a few weeks, a few months, or maybe a year or two, can I just tell you, Liberty Church is a church for you. It's why we exist. And we want to partner with you. We're here for you. There's a next step. But maybe there's some of you who are here and you're beyond the new construction phase. And you're in a place of being under renovation. And that's this idea that I'm going to take something that was old and make it new again. I'm going to remodel a bathroom. I'm going to remodel a kitchen. I'm going to do something brand new with what was already existing. And maybe for that, that's for you, the the people who've been following Jesus for a while. But you might have gotten into a place that's more like a rut with your faith. You know what I find it so easy is once we've been doing this long enough... We kind of like to marginalize our life because I kind of become risk averse and I stop having to worry about the unknowns and I just know how to do a system. And then what happens is what was once new becomes old. And maybe you're here and you've been following Jesus for a while and it's time to start asking yourself some questions. What in your life needs to change right now? What what are you holding on to that you need to let go of? Maybe you're holding on to some bitterness and unforgiveness because of how someone treated you or how someone spoke to you or how your mom or dad behaved towards you or a son or daughter or a sister or brother. And and you remember where you were when they said what they said to you and it cut deep like a knife. And you've been holding on to it and you just kind of quietly quit a relationship with someone. You just kind of slowly ghosted them and you allowed the relationship to drift into nothingness and, and, and you just kind of been chilling just like that. And, and maybe today this is a wake-up call to, that the Lord's saying, hey, it's time to forgive again. But you don't know, Pastor Kerry, what they said or what they did. You're right, I don't know. But you're only hurting yourself. And you're under construction just like me and the Holy Spirit's going, hey, let me get in there. Why? Because... I've got a plan for you. You were built to build like a crane, building a crane to build a building. But when you hold on to resentment and unforgiveness, it eliminates what I want to do in you and through you. What type of construction project are you today? Has your faith become a way to think rather than a life that you live? Where it's just kind of something that happens on the inside and on Sundays, but Monday to Friday, I just kind of let it settle on the back shelf what type of construction project are you new construction are you under renovation there's another type of construction called remediation I don't know if you've ever had mold in your home it ain't fun one day I was when we first moved to California we lived in a condo and somebody lived above us beside us I don't want to tell you what my rent was you would throw up right in this place it'd be bad and I was doing the dishes in, 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 after our dinner, and I started having drips on the top of my head. And I looked up, and 
the condo above was leaking below. And I went upstairs and I said, hey, I think you might have a leak. And they're like, I don't think we can. I said, well, can I look underneath your sink for a moment? And I opened up underneath the sink and this black demagogue and de demon jumped out at me and mold was growing. It was like the size of a woman's hair in Texas. And it was absolutely nuts. So we had to bring in a re remediation company and they had to tear out all the walls in our house. And it was just a gnarly, gnarly experience. And I... You know, I don't know if you realize this, but the Bible has a story and talks about how to deal with mold because all throughout Scripture, mold is synonymous with the power and the corrosive impact of sin. What type of construction project are you? Maybe it's time for some remediation. Has the corrosive power of sin crept into your life and now you have a secret thing happening that nobody else knows about and you just been holding on to it and you it's a secret addiction just numbing out to things and you just allowed this to fester in the background like under the cabinets of the sinks of my neighbor upstairs and you just allowed it to stay no one knows and you think your private rebellion isn't hurting anyone but you're fooling yourself there's a passage of scripture in Leviticus everyone's favorite book of the Bible and it talks about what to do with mold. And the Bible says if you found mold in the walls, then what you'll do is you call the priest and you get Pastor Matt to come over and examine the wall. And if we find the mold here, then we're going to just kind of scrape it out. And then the priest would leave and he would return in 7 to 14 days. And if when he returned in 7 to 14 days, the mold persisted, then they would tear down the entire wall and the priest would leave again. And then the priest would return in two weeks. And if the mold persisted in the house after 14 more days, then the priest would tear down the entire house because it was unclean. Because the power of mold will impact, listen to me, every room in your house if you don't deal with it. And some of you in this room have got some sin festering. You've been hiding it, and it's killing you from the inside out, and it's prohibiting God from doing the fullness of what he wants to do in and through you, and I want to encourage you for a moment, if that's you, then Liberty Church is the place for you. It's why we exist. What I love about the story with the children of Israel, when the priests would come in and tear down the entire house then the community of faith would gather around the individual and they would help them rebuild a home. In the darkest seasons of my life, I made so many poor choices that I thought there's no way there's a road to ministry for me. I was in my late teens and I just did some really dumb things and I thought, this is it. I'm never gonna make it in ministry, but you know what happened? I had some great men of God who came around me and they put my arms on their shoulders and they said, we're gonna walk with you. It's gonna be painful. It's gonna hurt for a little while. It's gonna be humiliating for a little while, but we're gonna rebuild this house. Why? Because God's got a call on your life. Why? Because there's something in you that's greater than he that's in the world. We've got a purpose for you. And what they did is they helped rebuild my life. Why? Because we're all under construction. Because I'm a tool and an instrument that God wants to use to build his church that builds people. Like a crane building a, to build a building. What type of construction project are you? Where are you at this morning? What does God want to do in and through you? You might say, well, you don't understand, Pastor Kerry, there's no way. I'm too far gone. I've made too many mistakes. You don't, you know, I got to keep this thing secret. You know what's so interesting? When the scripture is talking about building the house, he's referencing Solomon's temple. And what was interesting about Solomon, when he built his temple, we read about it in 2 Kings, that he wanted to reverence the Lord and, and respect the Lord so much. So when they started the construction project on the temple, he didn't want any sound of instruments of iron to be heard because he wanted to honor and respect the Lord, which meant... In this temple made of stone, 
the masons would have to come and measure every single aspect intricately, perfectly, then travel miles away to a quarry and like a masterpiece chisel away at stone and then carry them back over and put it into the temple of God, brick by brick and stone by stone, like a perfect masterpiece of a stone mason. And you might be here going, you don't understand where I'm at and what I've done and what the things that if I told people it would be too far gone, you don't realize, but what I want to tell you and what I came to tell you is this, that in your darkest moments, in the places where you felt God was further than you could ever be, he was working masterfully like a stone mason, chiseling away some things, removing some issues to pick you up and carry and fit you in brick by brick and stone by stone into the temple of God because you're under construction. He's working on you. He's working in you. Why? Because he wants to work through you. Are you with me this morning? He wants to use us jacked up, messy, imperfect people to build his church, which builds people just like a crane, building a crane to build a building. What a privilege. What an honor to be a part of the fabric of the body of Christ to be under construction, to recognize I've not arrived, I haven't made it, I still have some issues, but God's working on me. And in the process of God working on me, he's giving me a testimony. And you know what my testimony is gonna do? It's gonna set some people free because we find freedom by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony, which means that no matter your past, no matter your story, no matter your belief, you are loved, you are chosen, and you're here for this moment to build the church, which is building people, come on, like a crane, building a crane to build a building. So today, as you're on your way out, I want to encourage you to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you, to challenge you, to encourage you. God, what do you want to do in my life? What do I need to remove? Some of you might need to get another brother or sister in Christ and go to them and say, hey, I, I, I've made some poor mistakes. I've missed the mark. I need to confess some things to you. And look at me, church. If you're on the receiving end of that, if you take a deep breath and realize the beautiful thing that's about to take place and you make sure you grab their arms and put them on your shoulder and say, I'm going to walk with you. You're not alone. I've been there too. Are you tracking with me, church? We're going to rebuild the house together because I'm under construction too. Because I'm a little bit messy. I'm a little bit jacked up. But God's using me too. Amen? Amen? You know, I want to take the last few moments of my time with you today and give some people in this room an opportunity to actually begin the journey with Jesus. You know, there's a starting point. It's a starting point with him. Maybe you're here and you can't even begin the construction because you haven't started with Jesus. I mean, he's the key factor. He's the linchpin. The Bible says he's the cornerstone. And you might have been trying to do things on your own and you're wondering why it's not working. Well, you haven't started with the master builder yet. And there's a starting point. It's not your heritage. I don't care if you grew up going to church, if your mom and dad have been in church your whole life, there's a starting, it's not through osmosis, it's not by driving by church buildings, it's by beginning a journey with Jesus. It's by saying yes to him. You're saying no to your past and you're saying yes to him. And in a moment, I'm gonna give you a chance to do just that with no embarrassment to anyone in the room. But listen to me for a moment. Some of you in this room may have made a decision like this, but you've been running from God and today is your day to come running back. It's time to begin some new construction again. Can I get an amen? So would you do me a favor? Heads bowed, eyes closed, nobody looking around, nobody moving. If you're here and you've never prayed this prayer, then I wanna challenge you to pray this prayer with me, whether it's the first time or the first time in a long time. I'm gonna pray it out loud and I wanna challenge you, just repeat it after me in the quietness of your own heart or in a small whisper. Just say, dear God, I know that you love me, that you've given me purpose, but I'm not perfect. Would you forgive me? I want to start new construction today. I want you to use me to build your church so I can build people. In Jesus' name I pray. 
You should keep your heads bowed, eyes closed, nobody moving, nobody looking around. If you prayed that prayer with me, whether it's the first time or the first time in a long time, would you do me a favor? In a moment, I'm gonna count to three. When I get to three, would you just put your hand up and put it right back down? You're saying, Pastor Kerry, I prayed that prayer. Pastor Kerry, I'm starting brand new today. I'm starting with you. If that's you on the count of three, lift your hands and put them right back up, up and put them right back down again. Are you ready? One, two, three. Put your hands up. Wow, wow, wow. Thank you, thank you. All over the room, I see those hands. Awesome. Anyone else? Wow, 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 wow. Anyone else? Awesome, awesome. God, we just thank you for what you're doing in this place. We thank you that you are working on us, you're working in us so you can work through us. God, we recognize today that we are under construction and we open our hearts and our minds to you. Holy Spirit, speak. Show us the things we need to change, rearrange, and remove. God, we give you the honor and the glory in this place. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, amen. Would you do me a favor? Can we give a hand clap to the men and women who pray?